Hi folks, uh, this is Richard Hall and uh, from uh, Stonehenge RTRO and I've also got Kay with me. Say hello Kay. Hi everyone. Right. And uh, what we'd be good looking at tonight is of course is the uh, night sky. Okay, How laptop we do- is not working so I'm just going to restart your laptop so if you can touch Okay. <laughs> well we're just getting I guess at the end of the week we've got um, the equinox coming up. And, of course, the solstices and the equinoxes represent the um, changing points. That's the, actually the importance of them, is they mark the actual changing points in the seasons. Uh-huh. And what you will find is that every major religious festival in the world is related either to a solstice or an equinox. Uh-huh. Uh, so, for example, if I say to you December the 25th, you immediately think of, of Christmas, but, in fact... Uh, in the past, going back 2,000 years ago, December the 25th was the date of the, the winter solstice right, in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, the spring equinox, of course, was Easter and so on. And again, you might think, oh, well, that's, that's all to do with Christianity. But have you ever wondered what the Easter eggs are to do with and the Easter bunny? You see, that actually goes back to the ancient traditions, doesn't it, Kay? Mm. Yes, and probably a lot further than we've got records for. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Right. We'll So, but it, if what you'll find is that we, as we go through the seasons, each season has got its own pageant of stars. And there was the rising of particular stars, which for our ancestors was all important because that marked the changing of when we were going to do things. I mean, we're so, we're so used to having our our own uh, technology around us all the time. We tend to forget what it would be like if you didn't have that, you know. Um, but just think back in the past. When did you sow? When did you sail? You see, you do these at the wrong time of the year and you're going to be in big trouble. Your crops could fail. You don't end up by going where you want to. So timekeeping was all important and that's the reason why they, they used, that, uh, used the stars because the stars were like the messengers from the gods, as it were. Yeah. Kind of a combination between the stars and the moon and the sun, isn't it? Because the moon is kind of your monthly one. That's right, yeah. Yeah, and the sun is the one that gives the solstices and equinoxes, which gives you a restart button if you need it, if things have got a bit out of sync. Yeah, that's right, Mm. yeah. But uh, a lot of people don't realise that, you know, that all the different things that we have going and so on are all related to... um, to the, the cycle of the seasons that we're looking at, yeah. Yeah, the only one we've got left like that is Easter, isn't it? Yeah. That Easter is still governed by the moon as well. That's right, yes, yeah. Hey, we've got our picture on. Mm-hmm. You need to talk to the microphone. <laughs> Hello. <Yeah. laughs> right, we've got picture. <laughs> okay, okay uh, now if you can't see it, you can see a picture of Kay now. And also, it's like there was a thank Dame Broughton who supports this programme. Anyway... Uh, we'll get on with looking at our, at our night sky and what we were talking about a little bit earlier on. Okay. Hello. <laughs> Here we are again. Short-haired K. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Oh, well, looks like we... You get a beautiful view of the night sky from Stonehenge out here, <laughs> just in case you hadn't realised. <laughs> if I go on screen again now, I guess I should start off by talking about if those of you getting up early in the morning, uh, what you'll notice is it's a nice clear sky. Even sometimes it's not a clear sky. Are you talking? Can yes. you turn yourself off? That's why people can't okay. hear what okay. you're saying. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Okay, go for it. If you get up in the morning and uh, you look out, you see this brilliant star. I mean, it looks like a searchlight in the sky looking towards the east. Well, that is no star. That's, in fact, the, the planet Venus. Uh, and for those of you watching this on TV, you can see another bright star underneath it. That's actually the planet Mercury. And, of course, 
These photographs you look at now are taken from the Hubble Space Telescope all right, above, above the Earth. But you can see Venus looking just like that, a brilliant searchlight in the morning, in the morning sky. So that's, that's brilliant Venus there at the moment. And Venus has always been a world of absolute mysteries. So let's have a look at something, because I can always remember going back to as a kid, all the stories we had about the planet Venus and Venusians and so on. All right? Coming up on the screen now, you can see the sun and the planets to scale in size, of obviously not distances and so on. And the important planets have always been what we call the terrestrial planets. Those are the little tiny rocky planets like the Earth, closer to the sun. Well, I don't have to explain to you all about the planet Earth. You know that. It's a nice rocky world with oceans of water and abundant life and so on. All right? And it always used to be believed that this is going back just over 100 years ago now, before people actually knew anything about nuclear energy, to try and explain how the sun and other stars shone. And it was believed that they did so by gravity. Right? So what would happen is that the sun is the whole matter of the sun is gradually collapsing, and, gra and it, as it does so, it releases energy. Now this means, of course, the sun is would be getting smaller, and it was uh, brighter in the past uh, than it is now. All right. So looking outwards of uh, the different planets, if you look outwards towards Mars, okay, you used to believe that Mars was a lot older uh, in the sense of not being born earlier but its evolution was earlier because as the sun cooled mars was the first of the terrestrial planets where conditions were reached a point where life could exist so that's where we have the idea of martians however it was more than that because when you look at the mars through a telescope you see these these patterns all right dark and light and orange markings when well, the orangey yellow areas are obviously we thought were deserts we can see polar caps which change just like the earth does with the seasons but there were these dark areas but the interesting thing was the dark areas changed with the seasons and so the belief was that what we were looking at the dark areas was actually vegetation on mars so here they thought they had direct evidence of life on mars and that of course gave rise to things like war of the worlds because remember mars evolved earlier than we did therefore uh, anything that's evolved on there would be more advanced to us and of course as their world began to die as the sun got cooler and cooler and it got colder and colder on mars uh, the inhabitants of mars would decide to take over the earth and that's I say where the war of the worlds comes in and so on venus on the other hand who was closer well, unlike Mars, we can't even see the surface of Venus. Its surface is completely shrouded in cloud. And it was believed, well, if Mars was older, in a sense, in its evolution, then Mars, uh, Venus must be younger. And therefore, what we've got on Venus is, uh, if we could go beneath the clouds, the reason why it's so cloudy is underneath there are tropical swamps, right? So... It literally, um, Venus was our uh, Jurassic Park, as it were. And it was even suggested by some people that we might find things similar to dinosaurs if we actually travelled to Venus. Well, that's what we used to believe not very long ago. All right? But unfortunately... Um, Richard, you got... Mm. Unfortunately, what we've actually got is um, let's get, we find that when we look at Venus, actually, when we sent a spacecraft down there, we found it was the nearest thing to hell that you could imagine. The surface temperature on Venus is hot enough to melt lead. It's got an atmosphere which has got a, a pressure of about 90 atmospheres. That means you would get crushed by the pure atmosphere. Plus, the atmosphere contains sulfuric acid. So you get dissolved, crushed and burnt if you landed on there. So as I said, it was the nearest thing to hell that you can imagine. And the reason for this, in part, is that what we believed as the, how the sun was evolving was the complete opposite. When we discovered the nature of nuclear energy and began to observe stars and the properties of them, what we realised is that what powered the sun and the other stars was thermonuclear energy. And essentially, the sun is a gigantic thermonuclear reactor, right? And it's converting matter into energy. But what happens is, as it converts 
at the moment hydrogen into helium right the core of the of the sun is turning to helium and then what happens with the passage of time is that um what will happen is that uh it the sun actually gets hotter and hotter right as time goes on so what's actually happening happening is the sun is getting warmer and warmer and once upon a time earth was an ice ball but when the earth was an ice ball it was freezing cold on mars well conditions on mars were probably similar to that of the earth <clears throat> and there would have been water there and who knows maybe living things as well these um in fact there is a lot from the analysis of the atmosphere and so on, there's some suggestion that all this is correct, that there is, was once water on Venus. And that is why scientists are looking for the possibility that there are one place where life could still exist is in the atmosphere of Venus. So that's some of the things. So maybe once a time, upon a time, um, yeah. Couldn't life actually exist under the surface where there's some heat from the volcanic activity? Oh, it could live underneath, but this, the surface of it is so uh, horrendous now that all advanced forms of life would be completely wiped off from the, you know. So, and they think the only place we, we, where we can likely detect something is in the upper atmosphere, if it still exists, yeah. Anyway, now turning to our southern night sky, uh, as we come to the autumn stars, what we discover is that the uh, southern cross is at virtually its highest point in the sky. Right? And, um, of course, the southern cross is one of our seasonal markers. It marks off the seasons as it turns around. So it has it just goes around the south celestial pole. It never sets. goes in a big circle, like a big clock. So you've got it, so as it were, it's 12 o'clock position, it's 3 o'clock, 6 o'clock, and 9 o'clock position. And those positions in the sky actually mark the seasons as well that we're looking at. So this was also another wonderful timekeeper, as well, of course, as being an, a navigational beacon. Well, there's so much, we're coming up not very far away, actually. The nearest to it is actually on Sunday coming up, is the autumn equinox. This, of course, is the spring equinox in the northern hemisphere, and we're going to be putting on a special program at uh, Stonehenge. That's on the 20th, for those who can't see your slide. <laughs> yes, um, Sunday, March the 20th, and it's going to start at 6.45pm. The reason why we say 6.45pm is because we would like to line this up so that we can take people out to see the sunset over the stones and show you how the stones work at the equinox there. Yeah. But in addition to that, having a sunset, we're also going to be having live music out there. We've got Stefan and Keith coming out to be playing some music for us at the middle edge where you can experience acoustics. So if you want to come along and sing and dance, you're allowed to do that as well. And then afterwards, when it gets nice and dark, we're going to have stargazing as well. And I'm on to say here, in case people are looking at their weather charts and wondering about that one, we will run every part of the programme that we can, despite the weather. That's right, yeah. Well, the music we can always take inside. And for though, if, for example, we can't can't get the uh, stargazing underway, we've got some awesome audio visuals that I've made up. We'll take you through the autumn night sky and show the stars and planets. So we've, we've got that back up plan, but we're hoping for clear weather at the moment. All right. So we've got that coming up, but I, sh I should point out to you that we're going to be running regular programmes once a month, our special events for the public, which are going to include music, and, the, and local musicians are really pleased about that. And I know at the moment we've still got COVID and so on, but we think we can deal with that out at Stonehenge because we can keep the, the distancings of people. So we want to get some music back in our lives. And another one coming up very soon is a, we're going to be having a star picnic. Would you like to talk about that, Kay? The star picnic will start at 5.30, and it's really it's going to run something like four hours. In this particular one, you, you have your picnic, you enjoy yourself, um, and then later on there's stargazing as the evening starts to pull in. But of course, you can sit in the hinge and watch the sunset. Mm -hmm. So do make sure you bring something to sit on, otherwise you're sitting on the grass. And these days, you never know whether the grass is going to be slightly damp. So if I were you, I'd bring something to sit on, something to eat, something to drink, but we don't want alcohol, please. We don't want to deal with that. So bring something nice, but just not alcoholic. 
<laughs> yeah. Okay. And, and I'll tell you what, if you've never been out to the Henge before when you've got music there, you're going to be amazed at the acoustic properties of stone circles, which is one of the reasons why the stone circles were built round in the first place. But you'll experience that when you come out there. Okay. So that's what we've got coming up. Uh, well, that's on, that's on Saturday, April the 2nd at 5.30 p.m. We're going to be starting that one. Okay. Anyway, you can find out more of that information by simply looking at our web page. Now, OK, so going on from the autumn equinox, star picnic. I'm, I'm not sure what is happening here. <laughs> going backwards and forwards. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hello, we've actually moved forward. Right, OK, if you're looking up at the night sky... Right, and you um, look at the Southern Cross, which is it is high in the sky, just to the right of the Southern Cross, and look, it's actually in the Milky Way itself. You can see this bright patch, all right? And it is a bright patch in the Milky Way, and this is a, an absolutely amazing nebula. Well, I'm not going to go into too much detail. We can look at this later, all right? But it's a massive star-forming region, thousands of light years away, all right? And in there. This is just one of the photographs by the Hubble Space Telescope. This is the Mystic Mountain. All right? And that's only a small part of it. It's absolutely a spectacular landscape out there. But we'll, I'm going to take you on a journey through that at the next uh, night sky that we do. Now, we were going to have some music right now, but I think we'd better leave that for now because uh, having started late, we better get on with what we were going to talk about. If we turn around and look to the north... Uh, the most noticeable thing is the fish. Uh, you can look at the um, the hook in the sky. The sickle. The sickle. The sickle. I'll bring up the sickle. There it is there. Okay. And again, this it does look like a sickle in the sky, but the reason why it was named that was that, again, this was a, this was a, a, a beacon. When the sickle rose up in the morning sky thousands of years ago, back in Europe, it meant it was a time to bring in the harvest. So that's why it was called the sickle. The seasons move through the calendar, don't they, Richard? So when you talk about something being a signal for harvest, it isn't now. But if you put the sky back the way it was then, it was. That's right. The stars that we see in the, throughout the seasons gradually shifts. But we've nothing, it's nothing much in the human lifetime. But once you talk about thousands of years, it's a major change. And that's why you have to turn all the stars backwards to see what our ancestors were looking at. Now, the brightest star in, the, um, in the, uh, the sickle is, in fact, Regulus, right? which is one of the, I think it's about the 12th brightest star in the sky. It's one of the brightest stars in the sky. It's a blue-white star, and it's an amazing object. If you could stand on a planet near uh, Regulus, which, of course, is a, another star, all right? another sun it's 77 and a half light years away and you'd have to be some distance away from it because it's 150 times brighter than the sun but it's got this weird elliptical shape it's not round like our sun and the reason for that is that it's rotating so rapidly in fact in just under 16 hours it rotates on its axis they put that into proportion the sun takes 27 days to rotate right this thing is spinning so rapidly it's pushed forced into this ellipsoidal shape and in fact if it was spinning much faster than that it would absolutely disintegrate however the interesting thing is that this fast spinning very hot luminous star is um yeah it's not it's a multiple system now for those of you watching this on tv i've just pulled up the sun to scale so you can see how big our sun would appear alongside regulus but not only is the regulus uh a lot bigger is also considerably hotter right hence the amount of radiation now orbiting around uh in fact what we, we work out is that regulus is a, has four four suns see our system has only got one this one's got four let's pick them out for you okay number one there's a, a star little faint star orbiting a white star orbiting around it in a period of 40 days and this star we now believe is what we call a white dwarf Right. It's finished its life. It's, so once upon a time, there was a much brighter star there, and that's now faded away completely. All right. So that's the white dwarf. And nearby, right, there's another pair of stars, 
a binary pair who, who orbit around each other. They're a distance of 4,200 astronomical units. It's a long way. <laughs> you have an astronomical unit, if you're not sure, it's the distance between the Earth and the Sun. So it's 4,200 times further away than the Earth is from the Sun. Right? And this is a binary star. And these, this binary star, would you would recognise them as suns because one of them is only a little bit fainter than our own sun, right? And it is orbited by a red dwarf, right? So th that that is is uh, Regulus up there in the sky, and of course Regulus is part and parcel of the constellation of Leo. And at that point, I have lots more to show you, but I've, I'm going to have to leave that until next week. So uh, I'm going to have to say goodbye and K, you do the same. And when we get back again, we'll take you further into the autumn stars. We want to take you to Virgo and the great galaxies then. Uh, just to remind you, coming up, this weekend coming up, we've got the um, autumn equinox at Stonehenge. Can you stop? Mm -hmm.